If you're looking for the perfect gift for a loved one who likes to bake, why not try the Pancake Breakfast Gift Box from Mary Mac Bakehouse? It comes with everything you need for a delicious breakfast, including maple syrup from Paul Family Farms and O'Neill Coffee. You can find the Pancake Breakfast Gift Box and more at MaryMacBakehouse.com. Hello and welcome to In the Kitchen with Mary Mac. Today's recipe looks towards Valentine's Day and a really great gift you could make for yourself or someone that you love a lot. It's the Firehouse Red Velvet Cake with Bailey's Buttercream Frosting. If it sounds fantastic, it is fantastic. I'm telling you, I've eaten a lot of this over the last couple months and it is a delicious cake. As you heard, it contains Firehouse Red Ale, which is made by North Country Brewing in Slippery Rock, Pennsylvania. That was very hard to say. I'm very proud of myself. So Firehouse Red Ale itself, without being in a cake, is fantastic. It's delicious, and it's probably one of my favorite brews from North Country Brewing. I also love the You Jag Off No Parking beer that they make, <laughs> which is a nice light lager style beer and it's it's a very good beer too but the firehouse red ale is is my um, favorite so i was looking for a recipe that incorporated a red ale in it and voila i came upon this very weird red velvet cake recipe that as we said in our podcast last week had to have a little bit of tweaking and fixing done to it as far as the method and a little bit of the a little bit of the ingredients not much but it was an odd recipe, and I wasn't sure if the person had actually made it, although there were pictures with it. So, you know, kind of you're kind of like, uh, it's the internet. Maybe they found pictures of somebody's really nice red velvet cake and borrowed them. I don't know. But the recipe just, I thought, well, it sounds intriguing. I compared it to some other red velvet cake recipes, and it was a, it was reasonably similar to them. So I thought, hey, maybe it'll work. What the heck? Maybe it'll work. So I made it and it was really, really good. It has a different frosting on it than normal. I'm not going to do a big history on red velvet cake because the history of red velvet cake is, there's a lot of arguing that goes on about the history of red velvet cake. Is it like the Mississippi mud controversy, I, I guess? Similar to that, but a lot more aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's some serious aggression in the red velvet cake uh, So would debate. you say that these people are seeing red velvet? <laughs> yeah. So red vel so the the uh, idea of of it being a velvet cake comes from the like late 1800s when people discovered a way to make a lighter textured cake. In the 1800s the go-to cake usually had like 20 eggs in it. Like you'll find these old, <laughs> old recipes. One of the reasons is because eggs were smaller, but the other reason is, is because they didn't have things readily available to make a cake rise. For example, like baking soda was not super popular in that time period. But then when it started to be being used, cocoa powder also began to be a popular ingredient. So you could lighten up your cake flour by putting some cocoa powder in there. You could do some other chemistry kinds of tricks, you know, to do that. You used the cocoa with the acidic buttermilk and you know, putting a little vinegar in and that sort of thing. And I um, imagine this was probably before you could get, like, specifically cake flour. Like, it was probably right. just everything's the same flour. Yeah, everything was, they. it was sifted. They would sift a lot. Um, yeah. Because flour wasn't ground as finely as it is now. So they actually would have to sift it, you know, to get a lot of the stuff out of it. And that was very common. People began adding different things to try and make cakes taste a little better. The idea of the velvet cake was that the texture of the cake was like velvet in your mouth. You know, that smooth. I don't know. I hate velvet myself. I don't even like <laughs> to touch it. So I don't like to think about that being a texture that someone would enjoy. But velvet was ve uh, as a cloth was very popular in the same time period. Think about that. So when people, just like now where you would say something is silky, you know, people would think of velvet and think, oh, velvet, you know. So it was a very luxurious sort of a thing. So it made you think your cake was a very luxurious cake. So the fighting begins. It's considered a traditional southern cake. 
it's considered a traditional northern cake. It's considered a traditional Midwestern cake because all of those people made it. It kind of became a tradition for everybody in about the same era. So that's where the fighting comes in because the people in the South say it's a Southern cake and the people in New York say it's a New York cake. You know, so you get this, this, this arguing going on about it. But it seems to have hit everywhere in popularity about the same time, which is probably around the Depression because you couldn't get things, so you substituted other things. You couldn't have 20 eggs in one cake. No, you couldn't have a lot of cocoa. Just wait till it's done. Well, if this is a firehouse red velvet cake. We you know, that's fire. true. That's true. Let's just keep going. The volunteer fire. <laughs> the fire alarm just went off. So if you can hear that. You can probably hear it in the background. But our... it actually is appropriate for this yes. cake. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So the thing with the red velvet cake is it's not a chocolate cake. And now there's an argument there also, but we'll just bypass that one. It is not a chocolate cake. It uses cocoa. Here it's getting really loud, the siren. It uses cocoa more for coloring than anything else. Because if you use, if cocoa, plain cocoa, not Dutch cocoa, um, plain cocoa, for example, Hershey's regular old cocoa is not Dutch. So when you look at that cocoa, it's a more of a sort of a gray brown color. Now, Hershey's also makes a dark cocoa, which is Dutch. And if you would look at that and compare them, which I did when I started into this process, the Dutch cocoa is redder because it's um, had the acid neutralized in it. So it has a redder appearance. And the non dutch cocoa has that gray-brown appearance. But when it encounters the acid in this cake, it will take on a redder appearance. And that gives some red color to the cake. Now, people started adding red food coloring to it because the Adams Food Coloring Company came out with a red velvet cake recipe using, which people now typically use, an ounce of red food coloring. And it was like um, a special recipe from them. Another area that claims to have invented the red velvet cake. People also used beet juice because beet juice is super red. Like if you're canning beets or cooking fresh beets from the garden, it will stain your hands red. There is food coloring that is natural food coloring that is made from a combination of beet juice and I believe cherry juice. I'm not sure what else is in it, but it's very, it's, it's red. It, when you smell it, you can actually smell, you can smell the cherry, very light aroma of cherry. I used to work with the food coloring for another reason. It was in a, a science product at a company that I worked for and you could smell cherry so strong in that stuff. It was ridiculous, but it was an all natural food coloring. So. So then you have that. So around the time of the depression um, and the food coloring company started and you couldn't get as much cocoa, you couldn't get as much ingredients. This cake was a big treat because it, it's very special. It's a very good cake. It has all these ingredients in it that make it, you know, a special cake. And it became a very popular treat. And it continued through World War II. It was very popular around the country until probably the 50s when I believe the recipe was included in the Joy of Cooking cookbook, the first Joy of Cooking cookbook, I believe. And then it kind of blew up. It just, it always makes me laugh though when you see these coming from different places and there's this much fighting over it. Now the original red velvet cake was frosted with what was called ermine frosting or ermine frosting, which is a French style buttercream that uses, um, it's all, it uses like a white sauce in it. So you make a roux, you make a roux with flour and butter and you add your milk to it and cook it and, you, and it's this thickened milk. And then you let that cool. Once that's cool, you use that as your liquid to beat into either uh, regular super fine sugar, which is not quite granulated sugar or powdered sugar and um, butter. And you beat that in and it it's a really good, I'll tell you what, it's a good frosting for a lot of cakes because it's very light and fluffy and it's almost like um, whipped cream, but it's a little denser than whipped cream and it doesn't melt or collapse, you know? So it's a very, it's a good frosting. And that was the traditional frosting for uh, red velvet cakes. But 
it takes a little while to make it because you have to make your roux and you make your white sauce and you make sure it's real smooth and then you have to chill it until it's cool enough to beat into your frosting. So you've got some time consumed there. So people started making what you know of now, considered the traditional frosting, which is the cream cheese frosting. And that's typically what you'll get on almost all red velvet cakes these days. But a lot of people don't like cream cheese frosting. I do not like cream cheese. Well, I don't mind cream cheese frosting on a pumpkin cake, but I don't like it on red velvet cake. And I also don't like when people just make a chocolate cake and put red food coloring in Yeah, and throw cream cheese frosting on the top and say it's red velvet. Right. Right. Because it should not have a chocolate flavor to it. No. You don't want that chocolate flavor. You don't, you want, I'll tell you what a red velvet cake should be, a nondescript flavor. (laughs) Yeah. That's red. (laughs) That you're like. Hey, this is red and this, it's good, but I don't know it's what it like, tastes uh, like. It's like Gatorade flavors. It tastes like red. Yes. That's yes. what it is. What flavor Gatorade do you want? Red. <laughs> so Also, I love the the fact that the cake is velvet and the frosting is ermine. Yeah. I feel like you you have to eat it with a mink fork. Yeah, or there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just, it sounds so like luscious and fancy and it's the cake. The icing for this red velvet cake that we're going to give you is a Bailey's buttercream frosting. And this was with the original recipe that I found, but I did have to fix it because it was very wrong. It was a very extremely wrong sort of frosting recipe that had way, way more butter in it than anyone should ever put into a a frosting. It's just way too much. So what I did was I um, adjusted it like a normal buttercream frosting. <laughs> and then I then I made it and I said, yeah, that's it. That works good. That works really well. And you did it like an American buttercream, right? You didn't do all the steps and stuff? No, like, I did a regular yeah. buttercream frosting with um, just softened butter and powdered sugar and the uh, whipping cream. And uh, it worked very well. It actually worked very well. So... That's the cake that I've I've made this a couple times now, and it's very good. It's a little costly, just ingredient wise, especially. How about sticker shock and Bailey's? Wow, Bailey's Irish cream. I went to the store to get some Bailey's Irish cream, and I said, what? "Do you have those little bottles? Because <laughs> it's expensive. Wow, it's a popular thing. I mean, I'm sure that's why it's expensive. Because oh, yeah. it, well, and especially in the winter too. Yes. Like a lot of people yes. make holiday items with it and like cocktails and stuff. So I yeah. can imagine maybe during the summer it Put would it be in a their little nice cheaper. hot coffee, you know, that sort of thing. So the frosting was very, very good. So this this recipe, it works very well. There's a lot of I've I read a whole lot of red velvet cake recipes and tips and everything like that. And uh and I uh have eliminated several of the tips that were not good. <laughs> I have it down to, I have it down to a pretty good recipe now. So this is the Firehouse Red Velvet Cake with Bailey's Buttercream Frosting Recipe. And I think if you make this for someone for Valentine's Day, they will love you forever and ever and ever. Or they'll hate you. It could go either way. (laughs) If they have to eat the whole cake themselves, they'll... If they're trying to lose weight for their New Year's resolution... Maybe make them like a mini cake or yeah. something. Yeah, <laughs> or cupcakes. You could do cupcakes. Yeah. You could do cupcakes. This, the way th- um, that I did this, this is set up to be a two nine inch round layer cakes or two eight inch round layer cakes. So it's uh, two cake layers, frosting in the middle, frosting on the outside. If you don't like to do that style of a cake, if that's something that you're not interested, you could make a nine by 13 or you could do cupcakes whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. It's your baking, but this is set up for a a layer cake. And I am not a huge layer cake maker, but I will make a layer cake from time to time. (laughs) So, um, it wasn't, it's not, if you follow the instructions that I give you, especially red velvet cakes are super tricky to frost. If you listen and do it the way I tell you, you'll be able to do it. Okay. It also helped that it was, um, very, very cold here in the last few weeks. So, uh, it is a lot easier to frost cake. Even cupcakes, I usually put them in the fridge. Yeah. Like get let them get real cold before I frost them just cuz well I put mine in in yeah. the um I I put my uh sealant 
frosting on and put it outside Sealant in the cake. Frosting. Okay, yeah, we'll we'll get through that when I don't do. Don't most people but, call that a crumb coat? Yeah, a crumb coat. Instead of sealant. My sealant frosting. I put it on there and my crumb coat frost. I don't know the terms. You know, I you know I can't remember things. Okay, I never remember what that's called. Crumb coat. You'd think that'd be easy. <laughs> Okay. I, I like calling it a sealant, though. Yeah, I feel like that's the next Flex Seal product is Flex that's Seal what, icing. <laughs> that's what it does. <laughs> flex Seal icing. Hold those crumbs in there. Just Can. slapping a piece of fondant on it. We put this Flex Seal frosting on this here cake. Oh, that'd be funny. Ah, well, here we go. For the cake. This uses a lot of butter. You'll use almost a whole pound of butter in this whole deal here. Okay, so. For the cake, you need three-fourths cup of butter, one-fourth cup of cocoa, one ounce of red food coloring. That's one bottle is one ounce. A half a cup of firehouse red ale. You'll have to drink the rest of it. Two teaspoons of vanilla. One teaspoon of apple cider vinegar. A half cup of buttermilk. Two eggs. One and a half cups of sugar. One and a half cups of flour. One teaspoon of baking soda. Here's what you're going to do. In a small bowl, you want to warm the butter and melt it. You don't want it to get like hot, 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 but you want to warm it until the butter's nearly melted and then stir in your fourth cup of cocoa. And remember, we're using cocoa that has not been dutched. So if you use regular old Hershey's baking cocoa, that is not dutched. Should you sift the cocoa or yes. the flour? You can sift the cocoa if it's very lumpy. If it's not horribly lumpy, don't worry too much about it. Just mix that fourth cup of cocoa with your three-fourths cup of melted butter and then set it aside because you it, it'll probably be a little bit warm, so you want that to cool, okay? And make sure you mix it in really well so it's nice and smooth. Now, in another bowl, you're going to mix the food coloring. Be very careful with the food coloring when you open it and pour it into the bowl. The half a cup of Firehouse Red Ale and the teaspoon of vinegar. I used a um, one cup measuring cup to put those in, or you can use a small bowl. In your next bowl, which will be slightly larger, you're going to beat your eggs and sugar until they're very well combined and your sugar has started to dissolve into the eggs. Mix in the half cup of buttermilk and mix that really well. And then in your last bowl, which is going to be your largest bowl, you're going to whisk your one and a half cups of flour and your one teaspoon of baking soda together. So now that you have all your stuff ready to go, preheat your oven to 350, put your rack in the middle, and prepare your two pans by greasing them very well, two circles of wax paper to fit into the bottom of the pan, Stick that down and grease it again. Grease your pans really, really well. You can sprinkle a very fine layer of flour into them also, or one tablespoon of cocoa sifted in there. The only thing is the cocoa can be a little bit, you want to watch the cocoa. But I, I think if I have did it with just the wax paper and I greased it really well and it worked fine. The wax paper is, it's like magic yeah. when you're making any sort of a cake that you're taking out of the pan definitely don't ever make make one of these without putting wax paper in right there. right so now you got your pans all greased and prepped what you're going to do is you're going to add your egg and sugar and buttermilk mixture to the flour mix that really well then add your measuring cup that has your food coloring ale and vanilla and vinegar in to that mix it really well. Once you have those two containers of wet ingredients mixed in, you add your butter with cocoa, clean it out really good with a rubber scraper, add that in and mix that really well. I did not use an electric mixer to mix this cake. I used a whisk. It works fine. Um, it allows you to keep the mess down because that red stuff really goes everywhere. So mix it really well. Once you've got it really well mixed, divide it evenly between your two cake pans that you've prepared and put them in the oven and you're going to bake them for 30 to 35 minutes in your oven. They usually are done in about 30 minutes. So keep an eye. What I did, I set the timer for 15 minutes, took a little look at them, 
with my oven light. Don't open your oven door. And then let them go till 30. And then I checked them with a toothpick and they were done. So 30 to 35 minutes, depending upon your oven. Now you want to cool your cakes in the pans for 15 minutes on racks. Okay. And then once they've cooled for 15 minutes, you want to take a knife and go right around the edge of your cake to make sure it's all loosened from the pan and then tip them out onto your racks and then very carefully pull that wax paper off and let them finish cooling. Okay. Now your cakes are there and they're cooling and they're going to take a while to cool. If someone hasn't ever made a layer cake like this before, would you recommend letting the cakes cool upside down so it's like the the, oh, yeah. the domed side that's the top in the pan is facing down so it's flat or like flip them back over? I, I leave them upside down. Leave okay. your, Go ahead and leave them upside down on your cooling racks, okay? Um, it's nice to have an extra set of racks. I have uh, these little small ones that are like 10 inches square that I use for flipping cakes exclusively. They're my cake flipping racks. I would throw them away. I honest to goodness, I would throw them away because they're really old, except for they're great for flipping cakes. So that's what I keep them for. You can also use a plate to turn them off of the cooling rack. Also, you should find yourself a nice plate to set your cake on. Or if you have a cake storage container that's like a plastic cake storage container, get that ready. Or if like a grandparent at some point gave you a cake stand and you're like, when will I use this? This is the time. Yeah, this is it. This is your, this is it for you. Okay, now you're going to make up your icing. So get your uh, one cup of butter softened. You need one pound, 16 ounces of powdered sugar, two to three tablespoons of whipping cream, and two or three tablespoons of Bailey's Irish cream. One of those little mini bottles is plenty. The airline bottles or, you know, the little gift bottles that you can get. One of those is plenty. So if you don't want to invest in a giant bottle of Bailey's, get one of those. Now, you're going to need your mixer. <laughs> you want to take your butter and whip it up so it's nice and fluffy. Okay? And then alternately add powdered sugar, whipping cream, Bailey's. Powdered sugar, whipping cream, Bailey's. And keep whipping that up until you've incorporated your entire one pound of powdered sugar and all of your Baileys that you want in there. And then you keep whipping that up. And if it needs a little bit more whipping cream, you can add a little bit more. But it'll come up and it'll be nice and fluffy looking. It'll have like a, it has almost like a very, very light tan color to it. But you can tell when you're doing it, you know, once you whip up your butter, add like a cup of powdered sugar, a little bit of whipping cream, a little bit of Baileys, you know, and just keep adding that and whipping them up. And it'll come up really nice. You'll be surprised how nice it looks. Now what I did, I whipped up my frosting, set it aside, covered it until my cake was completely cool, which by the time I did everything, my cake was almost completely cool. So what you want to do on a red velvet cake or even a chocolate cake, um, red velvet is horrible for sticking out through your icing, especially white icing. So what you want to do is if you have a pastry brush or some type of a, you know, a pastry brush works really well, or even a little basting brush, go over and brush off the edges of your cakes and try to break loose any um, crumbs or anything like that. You can even lightly take your hand across the top and brush them off, but you want to get as much loose stuff off as you can. Okay. Once you have a, have your cakes brushed off, take one of your layers and put it it would be top side down the same way it was sitting on the cooling rack because you want the two flat sides in. So I always pick the ugliest one to put on the bottom. Okay, so you want the top side down. Make sure there's no loose stuff on there, you know, and then take about, it's going to be probably about one cup of your icing and plop it onto the middle of the cake and spread that evenly around. You want a layer of about a half inch thick of icing in the middle. So plop it on there. I use a uh, rubber scraper, put it on there, and then take a butter knife and spread it around pretty evenly. And then once you get that ready, you don't have to go the whole entire way to the edge because you'll be filling that in when you hit the sides. So once you get that on, carefully take your other layer, turn it over 
so that the flat side will now be down on top of the icing and position it on top of that and very gently press it down with your hands. Now again, take your brush and brush off the sides of your cake. Make sure you got all your loose crumbs off. And now you're going to take your butter knife and you're going to put a very thin coating of icing all around the sides of your cake. I would say about a tablespoon at a time. Scoop up with a butter knife and go around and just cover it. You know, if you, you've probably now seen a rustic cake. That's basically what a rustic cake is. You're putting a crumb coat on the outside of the cake. So once you get it the whole way around, do the top again, a, just a thin coating of icing. You, you can see the cake through it. Mm -hmm. And then put that in your cake plate, you know, to cover it. And either put it in your refrigerator, clear off a shelf in the refrigerator, put it in there. Or like I did, I put it inside the container. It was approximately 12 degrees last night. So I just set it out on my bench on my front porch and let it solid up and give it about a half hour in the refrigerator or 15 to 20 minutes outside in 12 degrees. The icing will get real solid. And then you can frost your cake without fear of having a red crumb stick out there like a an eyesore on your cake. So once your cake is, once your um, crumb coat has solidified, take your icing. And again, I always do the sides first. Uh, go around and do your sides. Make sure you have good coverage and then put the remaining icing on the top of the cake, spread it around and get good coverage on it. It doesn't have to be perfectly smooth. It doesn't have to have a pattern. Make it how you want it. Don't overdo it though, because inevitably you'll pull up a thing and a big bunch of crumbs will come up. So just the red velvet cake is one you want to ice fast and move on with your life. So once you get the frosting on there, it's all ready. And it actually looks very nice. <laughs> it's going to look nice for you. And there is your firehouse red velvet cake with Bailey's buttercream frosting. This cake is better the second day after you've frosted it because it allows the cake to absorb any moisture from the icing where you have crisp edges on it or anything, you know, like that. And I, that's what I told my husband. I said, it'll be really good tomorrow. Although we did eat a piece right after I frosted it, but it's a very good cake. It's a very, I would say this is a very consistent cake recipe. It comes out consistently good. It's a very nice, deep red color. It's not freakishly bright red like a lot of red velvet cakes are <laughs> that people maybe took a white cake and added red dye to and that was a red velvet cake yeah no it it uh looks very um has that sort of beet red sort of a color it where looks it's real like dark. red velvet is what it looks like yeah like royal red velvet like, like if you queen. had a if you had a <laughs> dress that was red velvet and a ermine <laughs> Yeah, and an ermine, ermine collar around collar it. Collar on that's a red velvet dress. That's what this cake is. That's it. That's what this yes. cake is. It is totally a queen of hearts cake. Perfect for Valentine's Day. But the best part about making this cake is you get to drink the rest of that can of Firehouse Red. And if you buy a six pack, we got like five more cans to drink. It's very good. It's a very good beer. If you get a chance to be in Slippery Rock and go to... North Country Brewing. It's a wonderful place. They have all different sorts of beer that they brew themselves. They have a wonderful menu, great food, and you can get uh, North Country Brewing beers all over the place. If you go to their website, they have a beer finder on there and it tells you where you can find your North Country Brewing supplier which was very helpful to me because I'm thinking I got to drive to Slippery Rock and get this firehouse red. And no, I didn't. I only had to go one block down from my grocery store and it was at a beer distributor there. So check out their website, check out the beer finder and make yourself a delicious firehouse red velvet cake because you will appreciate it. Yeah, don't make it for somebody else. Make it for yourself. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> And make sure to check us out online on Facebook and Instagram at Mary Mac Bakehouse, on Twitter at Mobile Mary Mac and Mary Mac Podcast, and on our website, MaryMacPodcast.com. Thanks a lot for listening if you did, and if you didn't, too bad for you.